The worrying discovery of the new and more transmissible COVID-19 variants in Canada has the Prime Minister promising tighter restrictions on travellers. So far, over 160 confirmed or presumptive cases of the strain first detected in the UK have been found in four provinces and at least eight cases of the South African mutation in Alberta and British Columbia. The premiers of Quebec, Ontario, Manitoba, all pressuring Ottawa to bring in new border rules to stop the influx of these variants. The message from Ottawa, though, is stay home unless absolutely necessary. We're working very carefully and very diligently on the new measures we will be bringing forward uh, in uh, the coming days uh, to make sure that we are further discouraging non-essential travel, that we are further keeping Canadians safe, but we are not bringing in hardship around our supply line. Prime Minister, as he spoke in Ottawa yesterday, his Rideau Cottage briefing, making the point that Canada's supply of essential goods has to be protected as new border restrictions are considered. That's one of the topics I want to address this morning with Dr. David Naylor, who's the co-chair of Canada's COVID-19 Immunity Task Force, a professor of medicine, president emeritus at the U of T, and he's in Toronto this morning. Dr. Naylor, thank you for coming back to our program. Pleasure. Good morning, Heather. Good morning. Premiers are calling for them, Dr. Naylor. Doctors are calling for them. And it looks like there will be new travel restrictions in some form. Is that the move for Canada to make at this time? Yes, I'm, I'm afraid it is. I know it's tough in terms of making sure those supply lines stay open. Uh, you know, there's also, uh, obviously, people who want to travel for a variety of reasons, sometimes essential. So these things have to be done with some finesse. But we do not want to be in a position where we are adding to what is already uh, an established uh, number of these variants of concern in the jargon. Uh, the argument that people make against uh, border controls and travel restraint is they're already here. We're closing the, do the door after the horse is bolted. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, opening the doors to a stampede of these variants is a very different matter. So. Uh, it's a judgment call. Uh, there's uh, there's some finesse needed, but yes, yes get on with it. We, we need to tighten up. It, it sounds like Ottawa is considering a whole range of options in terms of severity from this mandatory 14-day quarantine for travelers coming in. Manitoba's already gone that route uh, just today, coming up. And uh, perhaps the more extreme things, you know, barring all non-essential travel. On that spectrum, where do you fall? I probably fall uh, a little bit more on the hard line, um, but you know the challenge here, Heather, is trying to marshal evidence to support a harder line or a softer line uh, is is difficult. A lot of this is unprecedented, and we're making educated guesses. For me, it's a bit of the precautionary principle. Uh, you know, it's cited too often. It's it's not as straightforward. Often there are trade-offs when we apply it. But here's one where I'd say. Uh, Let's be careful. You, you really don't want to be adding you know, large numbers of, of new sources of concern, new sources, new sources of infection, well, especially here's some, those go faster. Sorry, I, here's some evidence. The numbers that we have, Canada now with more than 750,000 cases, and less than 2% of those cases, Dr. Naylor, are believed to be linked to travel. So would that be supportive of the fact that they work? Uh, I think we, we have a pretty good idea that travel, uh, you know, at this point in the epidemic is going to be less of a factor simply because we've got a lot of community spread. But yes. Uh, maybe I wasn't clear. The, the, travel, travel the, the restrictions not. that are already in place, is that an indication that what is already in place does work and therefore would encourage, as you suggested, even perhaps a tougher line here? Yeah, so as I said, you, you just got to be careful because we, when you have a lot of community spread, as we've had in the second wave, you will predominantly see person-to-person -person domestic spread. So the numbers will always be tipped away from, from travel in that, that situation. But yes, no matter how you cut it, there is a case here with these variants for being careful. So is that what you're advising Ottawa at this point, the harder line? I'm afraid it is, yes specifically shutting down all non-essential travel? I haven't gone that far. I haven't been specific. I don't think that uh, we, most of us sitting here on the sidelines can make the trade-offs. 
but I have urged them to take this very seriously and to consider how they can make sure that we do not have undue numbers of these variants arriving. Um, caution needed, more importation of these, these more infectious variants is really not what we need at this stage in the epidemic. So far, it looks like the vaccines cover them, but the last thing we need is to have mutations that could, could begin to escape vaccine control. So yes, I've said, uh, let's err on the side of caution. But so, it is a judgment call. It's yes. a judgment call for them to make. Some of the early research I'd seen indicated that uh, projections were these variants could become the dominant strain in Canada even by the end of next month. Is that is that the research that you're also understanding? Yeah, I've, I'm familiar with the, the models. Uh, you know, this is the, the problem of exponential growth, Heather. The, the same challenge you have with any uh, reasonably infectious agent like this virus, it can move quickly. Um, it displaces uh, other strains that are less efficient. Uh, you know, th this is a game where it's survival of the fastest, not just survival of the fittest. And the faster variants will come to dominate the caseloads, and uh, then it becomes multiplicative. Faster begets faster begets faster. That's what's going on here. And so the need to get vaccines in arms as quickly as possible. And there's tremendous frustration this week because there's no supply coming in, as you know better than any. The big issue was yesterday, the threats coming out of Europe that it might impose import controls on vaccines produced there because it's having supply issues as well. Of course, the Pfizer vaccine that Canada gets is produced in, in, in Belgium, so that would be affected by that. The Prime Minister yesterday was reassuring Canadians that he is confident Canada will have its supply. Do you share that confidence? I, I share the hope um, and uh, certainly uh, would encourage uh, all of our leaders to uh, put maximum pressure on uh, our friends in the EU and uh, uh, to make it clear to them that uh, this is a time when uh, allowing other countries to uh, you know, be part of what has been a global effort and to have contracts honored matters. You know, in the same vein, I have to say, at some point here, we have to redouble our efforts to make sure the whole world is covered. Uh, you know, vaccine nationalism cuts in negative directions for everybody, and, and we we need to look after our own, but also worry about a lot of countries that are really way down in the queue for vaccines. But right now, uh, I think a little bit of Canada firsting with our European friends is really important. And I, I'm hopeful, but concerned. And is there anything else that you're advising Canada do to make sure that the supply chain isn't disrupted? Very little you can do except to make sure that you have diversification to the greatest extent possible. And uh, that means uh, thinking about uh, supplies like AstraZeneca as a source uh, based in, in the UK, uh, less likely to be affected by an EU position, given Brexit and the, and the current uh, situation uh, in terms of the European Union. Uh, also, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine would again be less likely to be subject to pressure from the EU. So. Those are two vaccines that are well along. Uh, the AstraZeneca data are in the hands of the regulators, as we all know, they've been published. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine should be coming to results very soon. Uh, they also will get a look. That may be part of hedging our bets, uh, but not likely to be relevant until the start of the second quarter. Okay. Two more questions in our conversation today. The Q jumpers. We've been covering this story. The BC couple accused of flying. They were a wealthy couple accused of flying up to a remote community in Yukon yeah. to get their shots. Now, in your medical career, I don't imagine queue jumping is an issue that you have not dealt with in, in some sphere or another. Is there any way to, to stop it? I, I, th I think that the provinces have to be very careful about uh, making sure that they have some sense of the person turning up, whether they have health card, identification, etc. I think that's appropriate. You know, I, I, I think Canadians have like no tolerance for this. Um, we have a healthcare system that's grounded in principles of universality. It's not always perfectly fair by any measure. It doesn't cover everything. But there's an ethos that we're, we're, we do healthcare that way here, and it, it's different than the US. This is one where, unlike, say, a queue for heart surgery, everyone's waiting. 
Everyone wants the jabs that, they, that will get them to a state of immunity, we hope, and help us get out of this uh, period of, uh, you know, really crisis, there's no other word for it. So I think there's, there, there would be wide public support for making sure that the people who need the virus first get, need the vaccine first get it. And right now, the, the further problem, Heather, is we're not doing classic public health vaccinations right now. We're not going for needles in arms as quickly as possible where, you know, some jostling in the queue may happen. People may slip in because there's millions of vaccines being done. Uh, this is where we're focused with a small supply. Three million people can be covered on people who are most at risk. Yes. Indigenous communities, uh, the elderly in congregate settings, healthcare workers. So to push those people out of the queue, I think really sticks in the craw of Canadians. So I hope provincial governments are, are meticulous. And I think most Canadians uh, you know, are going to wait their turn. Uh, not easy. Uh, they worry about loved ones. They worry, worry about their own health. But I don't think there's going to be any tolerance for queue jumpers in this current circumstance. No, we're certainly hearing uh, very strong public outrage. Last question for this conversation, and it's about something that we hear often from our viewers, Dr. Naylor. Um, public health officials tell Canadians to do more. You know, we're 10 months in, do more, stay the course. But <laughs> what we hear is that they're not sure what more they can do at this point, and they'd like some consistent messaging. What can you offer? But that, I think Canadians have been brilliant. So uh, put, put me in the category that um, I would start by thanking them. That's the first thing I do. Um, you know, we've had a little uh, challenge in this second wave with people, with people getting fatigued, uh, not complying as tightly with measures. Got some evidence for, for that, certainly in Ontario with traffic patterns and so on. But I think the main thing people should do is stay home, try to stay in small, Define bubbles that are pre-existing. Be cautious, be patient, and know that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, the, I don't think haranguing Canadians further is helpful. I think encouraging Canadians and thanking them is kind of the key right now. Um, I think many of us are hugely impressed and grateful for the sacrifices people are making on the front lines. And just appreciative of our fellow citizens, so many of whom you know are still doing essential work and putting themselves at risk in a whole variety of ways. And uh, knowing that uh, where you can, if you can, stay home and uh, keep yourself safe. Will you come back and speak with us again? We always appreciate time with you. Thank you. Always a, always a pleasure. Thanks, Heather. Right. Good morning. Some clarity from Dr. David Naylor this morning, the co-chair of Canada's COVID-19 Immunity Task Force. Thank you again.